Forgiveness is the act. This is the Lost Mission Podcast. Welcome back to the show. My name is Don Van Zandt, and this is the Lost Mission Podcast, where it is our duty to help us as believers to get back to our mission of knowing and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'm glad you joined us today. This is our series on prayer, on the Lord's Prayer, and today we're going to talk about the fifth petition of the Lord's Prayer concerning forgiveness of debts, or forgiveness sort of in general. Um, but let's get into it today, all right? So, in, in, this, in this petition, Christ turns his attention to what is possibly the most difficult of all the petitions um, in the prayer. That's the petition for forgiveness. Forgiveness is not easy. It exposes flaws in us. Um, it sort of exposes the dirt under our fingernails, the dust under the rug, the skeleton in the closet, whatever sort of cliche that you want to use to describe forgiveness, it gets down to who we are. It exposes us because forgiveness is really quite confrontational when it comes down to it. Um, And the person that it confronts usually is the person that stares back at us in the mirror. It confronts us. It confronts the individual. It shows us who we are, all right? So that's what forgiveness does. It it really gets down to who we are and what we're really about. Um, But how does that relate to the Lord's Prayer? Well, quite simply, (laughs) by the fifth petition, uh, Matthew chapter 6, verse 12, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. So this fifth petition begins a little differently than the previous four, right? The, the other four petitions almost could stand alone as singular petitions all by themselves. But this petition is directly connected to the petition just prior to it. Um, and it's connected by a simple, small word, that word and, right? Um, this petition begins with the connecting word and. It ties it back to the previous petition, the petition for daily bread. Now, if you if you remember last episode, um, we asked the question that what would be most important to us when we pray. What what do you think we should ask for first, food or forgiveness? Um, and we said that Christ actually mentions food. He mentions daily provision for a reason. And and, and you can go back and watch that video in your own time. I recommend it. Um, I can recommend that you watch every video in this series. Um, but go back and check that video out if you want the answer to why. He mentions food before forgiveness. Um, It's quite interesting, all right? But in this petition, he ties the two together, food and forgiveness. Both are of incredible value and significance. But the point here seems to be that as soon as we pray for our earthly needs, we should immediately pray for our heavenly needs or our spiritual needs, right? We should pray for forgiveness, Arthur Pink, in his book, The Lord's Prayer, offers four reasons why these petitions are connected. First, we're taught that without pardon, all the good things of this life will benefit us nothing. A man in a cell on death row is fed and clothed, but what is the daintiest and costliest apparel worth to him as long as he remains under the sentence of imminent death? Our daily bread, this is from Matthew Henry, our daily bread doth but fatten us as lambs for the slaughter if our sins be not pardoned. So first of all, uh, what good does bread do us without forgiveness? Um, Second, our Lord would inform us that our sins are so many and so grievous that we desire not one mouthful of food. Each day, the Christian is guilty of offenses that forfeit the common blessing of life, so that he should ever say with Jacob, I am not worthy of the least of all mercies which thou hast showed unto thy servant. Third, Christ would remind us that our sins are the great obstacle to the favors we might receive from God. Our sins constrict the channel of blessing, and therefore as often as we pray, give us, we must add, forgive us. Right? Just as much as we pray, give us, we pray, forgive us. I think that's very important for us to realize, to understand that as 
equally as important as daily provision is in our lives in the natural sense, so is daily forgiveness as we need and, and seek for the mercies of God. Let's face it, we're in a sinful body, we're in a sinful flesh, we need the forgiveness of God. We need it every day, all right? And, and fourth of all, uh, Christ would encourage us to go on in faith from strength to strength if we trust God's providence to provide for our bodies should we not trust him for the salvation of our souls from the power and dominion of sin and from sin's dreadful wages. So what's Arthur Pink saying here? With all, with all of that um, aside, with all of that in mind, what is he saying? He's saying that food is nothing without forgiveness, right? Food is nothing without forgiveness. And what nourishment food gives our natural bodies, in that natural sense, forgiveness gives our souls in the spiritual sense. It's nourishment to our souls. Forgiveness is like food for the soul, right? Okay, um, so that's why we would need forgiveness. But Christ mentions debt, right? Specifically, he uses that word debt. Now, Matthew and Luke approach the, the petition, approach the Lord's Prayer a bit differently surrounding this idea, all right? Um, so let's compare sort of the Matthean account against the Lucan account. Matthew chapter 6, verse 12 says, And forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. But then Luke chapter 11, verse 4 says, And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not to temptation. Matthew uses the word debt. Luke uses the word sin. Now, Luke also adds the, the phrase, and lead us not into temptation at the end of, of verse 4 of chapter 11. That seems to be a simple divisional issue with chapters and verses. I wouldn't worry about that at all. The, it, the information is still there. It's just divided up a bit differently between the two accounts. Um, so not, not only difference in English is used there, debt and sin, but there is also a difference in the Greek. Matthew uses the Greek word aphelima. And Luke uses the Greek word hamartia, right? Um, but but what, what's the difference here, all right? What is the difference in aphelima and hamartia? What's the difference there? What's the difference between debt and sin? Well, okay, the Lucan account is actually very closely related to the English word for sin. So hamartia is a very close word to what we use in the English uh, for sin. So there's, don't, don't think too deeply into that, right? Matter of fact, it's the same word used later on in 1 John chapter 1, verse 7, when he says that if we walk in the light as he is in the light, uh, we have fellowship um, with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin, from all hamartia. But the Matthean account his wording is a little bit more interesting, and I think it deserves a little bit of, of conversation surrounding it. Because what Matthew does is he uses a word for debts, and it is translated into the English as debt. Um, he uses that Greek word, aphelima. Now, in, in the uh, Greek Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, when the law would speak of debts and loans and of forgiveness, the, the Greek word would, would be the same as what is found in the New Testament. It is that word, aphelima. Um, matter of fact, Deuteronomy chapter 24, verse 10. When you make your neighbor a loan of any sort, you shall not enter into his house to take his pledge. And when he speaks of this loan there, he is actually using that same, in the, when, when that's translated in the Greek, that same Greek word that is used for debt later on in the New Testament. The word is the same in the Greek New Testament as well as the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. But why does this matter, though? Why is this important? Um, well, I think it's important because we need to understand sort of the audience um, to which both of these men are writing. Luke is not writing to a Hebrew audience. He writes to Theophilus, and Theophilus is not a Jewish man. Um, but Matthew, when he writes, he is specifically addressing a Hebrew audience. Those are the majority of to whom his gospel is, is addressed to. So they would understand the wording there. When they would read debt, when they would read in the Greek, aphelima, they would know that what Matthew is referring to is the Old Testament idea of a repayment of a debt, a repayment of something that is owed to another individual, Right? Uh, so that, thus the difference in the wording in the two separate accounts. 
Um, also, Christ likely gave the teaching twice, gave it once to uh, those at the Sermon on the Mount and once to his disciples separately and could have used different words. That's a possibility as well. Um, but in our prayers, why does this matter to us when we pray? Because if I were going to pray about, um, Lord, just forgive my debts, um, <laughs> possibly I could think that God would help me to pay off my house or to um, help me to find enough money to make my credit card payment or something like that. Lord, forgive it. Or maybe that God would just do away with that. But then I would read in Luke and he would talk about sins. I'm thinking, oh, well, I don't know here. But I think it offers a bit of clarity uh, when we understand the concept in our minds that we have sinned, and we are sinful, and that that sin causes a debt in the spiritual sense from man to God. We are indebted to God. We owe a sin debt. I feel like that's pretty basic and that all Christians pretty much understand and know that we owe a debt to God. And we're not able to pay that debt, right? Like nothing that we could do could cause us to be able to just absolve our sin debt. That's why God sent his son. Christ died as the ultimate payment. Uh, we understand the atoning work of Christ. But for us, when we pray, it puts sin um, into a new perspective for us. Now, tr some translators actually use the word trespass. So whether you use debt, sin, trespass, whatever, just understand and know that when we pray this prayer, that we are saying, God, I am indebted to you. Forgive me. Lord, take this debt away. Forgive me of this debt. Right? Um, we need his forgiveness. We need it every day. So we pray, forgive us. Right? <clears throat> but what is forgiveness? If, if we can understand what a debt is, if we can understand that a debt is something that needs to be paid back and that we must seek God in order to have that debt paid back, and if we can understand that God delights and wants to forgive us of that debt, well then it kind of begs the next question, at least in my mind, well what is forgiveness then? What, why would we need forgiveness? Not why, but what is it? What is forgiveness? And I think there are some right views of forgiveness. I think there are some wrong views of forgiveness, but let's, let's just talk about what forgiveness is. I think this is the heart of the matter. This is the heart of the prayer. Um, we understand debt. We understand owing somebody something. We understand owing God something. But what is forgiveness? What is it in our lives? Is forgiveness just turning a blind eye to wrongs? Is it? I, I don't think so. Wrongs must be confronted and dealt with in some way. If somebody does you wrong, you need to deal with that. If you have, matter of fact, Scripture gives guidance for if you have ought, or if you have a problem with your brother, how you should conduct that, right? It, it tells us what to do. Matter of fact, it talks about before you offer your, your gift to God, to go and be reconciled to your brother. Um, so wrongs must be confronted and dealt with in some way. Be that through some external thing, going and having an actual confrontation. I don't mean going to have an argument, but, but to talk to the person that you have an issue with that possibly has done you wrong, to go to that person. That could be one way to deal with it. I would advise caution and care and a lot of grace and a lot of prayer ahead of time. Because you don't want to go with the idea of, I'm trying to start an argument or a fight. Um, but you may need to talk to a person. So be that through some external thing, like speaking with the, in, the offender, or internally, which is the most important, internally, by overcoming them in our heart and in our mind. Because we can go to people and never deal with it on the inside, still be full of bitterness and full of unforgiveness. So is it turning a blind eye to wrongs? No, I do not believe that it is. Is it never mentioning offenses again. You dealt with it. We're never going to talk about it again. Well, not necessarily, right? Not necessarily. Now, hear me out here because some of you are going to say, wow, you're kind of a hardliner. I'm not trying to be that way, but just hear what I have to say. Not necessarily. While it's not healthy to bring things up over and over and over and over again, that's not healthy behavior. Um, forgiveness can be a process, so if a person has done you wrong, you may feel the need to go talk to them about this issue. You may feel the need later on to bring it up again as you're processing your way through it. Right? Um, so it's not just never mentioning things again. This process may or may not require multiple conversations. If you are the person that has offended, if you are the person that, that is in need of forgiveness, 
then give this person person grace in that moment. Give them room to express themselves, room to talk, and to come to you as many times as they need to, as long as they're working toward a resolution, right? Now, if you're the person that has been offended, if you're the person that is trying to forgive, well, every time it comes to mind, don't call or text this person or go knock on their door and say, look, we need to talk about this again. No, that can be unhealthy. That can cause greater damage. If you've always got to bring it up, don't go looking for a fight, right? Um, so it's not always not mentioning offenses. But there does come a time when it needs to be resolved. <sighs> Is forgiveness passive, aggressive, grudge holding? No. <laughs> Okay, forgiveness is not passive aggressive grudge holding or even just aggressive grudge holding. If you're still holding a grudge to the person you claim to have forgiven, I would say you're likely not there yet. You've not actually forgiven them. You may be working on it, but you're not there yet. If you hold a grudge, well, 15 years ago, you remember you did this thing and I just can't get over it. And I'm still upset. I forgive you, but I'm still upset. Well, I, I doubt that you've actually forgiven them right? <laughs> so it's, it's not passive aggressive grudge holding. Um, and, but here's my, here's my advice to you. If that, if that is you in your prayer, because we're talking about prayer, keep at it, keep praying about it because you know, you're on the right path. And I believe that a person that is consistently, constantly seeking God in the area of forgiveness, um, that, that God is, is showing that equal measure of grace to them. So keep at it. Don't get discouraged. Don't be overcome. Just Press forward with God, right? Um, you'll get there in time by the help and grace of God, right? Is it talking through and dealing with the nuances of issues and coming to some sort of reconciliation? Ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. We would hope that that's what could happen. Two people are at odds, one with the other. There's an offense there. They sit, they have a conversation, they talk it through, and they reconcile. They sort of, as the old saying goes, bury the hatchet. It's over. Then they move on in brotherly love. That is the most ideal thing. So a good mutual understanding developed through open and honest conversation is, in my opinion, one of the best things to do to work toward forgiveness. But that may not always be the case, right? Um, maybe you have tried to speak with somebody and they're unwilling to have the conversation. Or maybe you just bring it up way too much. Right, So that while it may be the most ideal, it may not always be the thing that happens. But the goal is forgiveness. All right, so at the top of the show, I told you the, for, the definition of forgiveness. Let me give that to you now. Forgiveness is the act by which an offended party removes an offense from further consideration, thereby establishing a basis for harmonious relationships with the offender. And that is from Stephen Westerholm, Canadian scholar. The goal is, is to be able to put things behind us and to be done with that. And that's why we pray, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. In an article from Psychology Today, they talked about forgiveness. Um, and this is what they had. It was a fascinating article. I'm going to share with you a small excerpt from that article. Here's what they said. Forgiveness is the cornerstone of any relationship, romantic or otherwise. We assume people see life the way we see life. However, there are as many perceptions as there are people in this world. Our lack of understanding of other people's perceptions can create gaps built on miscommunication, anger, animosity, and emotional disconnection. However, our relationship with forgiveness can help bridge these gaps. It would do us well to understand that whether we need to forgive or whether we need forgiveness, it would do us well to understand that everybody doesn't view the world the same way in which you view the world or the same way in which I view the world. Quite honestly, there are times that I will look around at my life, I will have a perception, my perception is wrong because I have a bias, I, have, I believe things that may not actually be the truth or the fact of the matter. And so as such, I, I develop this... It, I, and I believe it to be the truth, but it's not the truth. Likewise, there are people out there that uh, you may deal with that just they, they think they see it the right way, but they don't. You may think you see it the right way, but we don't. That's where communication comes into the, the picture there. And we were able to see things, and it fills in those gaps. 
So, so in, in your conversations about forgiveness, be willing to hear what the other person has to say and don't jump to conclusions. In your prayers concerning forgiveness, understand that you may not have all of the facts in the way that you suppose that you have the facts. That is why we pray to an all-knowing and all-sovereign God, because he really and truly does have all of the facts, and he really and truly does know the truth and the heart of the matter. So when we pray, forgive us, we know that God is truly forgiving because he knows the truth, right? So how does this affect our prayers? We pray that God, in his sovereignty, would forgive us for the sin of unforgiveness to others, right? We pray, God, forgive me for being unforgiving and that he would grant us grace to forgive. We trust his guidance through the process, no matter how long it takes, like I said, forgiveness can be a process. It's not always a one and done. It's not always we talk about it once and the issue is resolved. We pray and we pray and we seek God and we allow the Spirit to guide us through those difficult times, right? Okay, so one thing I do want us to understand is that this prayer, this petition, is for believers. This is not intended for unbelievers, unsaved, unchristian people. So when we pray, forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors, and when Luke would write, forgive us our sins, that is intended for believers. So what's the point? The point is this, that believers sin, that Christians sin. Now I understand that it is not always popular to view Christians as sinful. A lot of people that I know and that I am around, they don't believe that Christians ever sin. <laughs> I don't see how they believe that, because to me it's sinful just to even have that idea, because it's prideful. <laughs> but forgiveness is not a matter of sonship. It's a matter of fellowship, right? Forgiveness is not a matter of sonship. It is a matter of fellowship. As believers, we understand that when we are saved and regenerated by the Spirit, we receive the Spirit of adoption, right? And it's by that Spirit that we cry, Abba Father. And that spirit then identifies with our spirit that we're God's children. So the sonship portion, the coming into the family of God, the regeneration, the salvation of the soul takes place by the spirit and brings us in communion with God. So the forgiveness element that exists there um, takes place within the family. And we, we, we have to look at it and understand this is like a family issue. That, that forgiveness in this context is a, it's, a, it's, it's a problem to be dealt with between brothers and sisters. Not one that immediately isolates someone outside of the body of Christ. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. For you have not received a spirit of slavery leading to fear again, but you've received a spirit of adoption as sons by which we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit, that we are the children of God. So the Spirit does the work. God saves us. We are the children of God, and we're part of the family of God. So forgiveness becomes an issue of fellowship, not one of sonship. But unforgiveness affects the way that we function in the body. If I am not in fellowship with God, I cannot pray effectively. Uh, but fellowship with my brother helps to determine my fellowship with God. Hence, forgiveness is important to prayer. The, to, to suppose that somehow unforgiveness in our heart would affect our salvation would really lead to a view of salvation by works. And we understand that it's not by works that we're saved. So works don't save us. So then what is the issue? What's the sin issue? The sin is the separation that it causes within the body itself, right? Um, when I have unforgiveness in my heart, I have difficulty praying. I have difficulty reading my Bible. I have difficulty in worship because this thing is in my heart. It's in my mind. It's in my heart. And I have to deal with that if I want to really have communion with God. Believers need forgiveness. We do. Regularly. On the daily. So can a Christian live in unrepentant sin? If the person absolutely refuses to forgive, they say, no, absolutely not. I will not forgive. Is that person no longer saved? Um, and this isn't intended to be a conversation surrounding eternal security. Uh, perhaps someday we'll, we'll talk about those, those issues. That's not the point here. Um, the question is, uh, can a person, can a Christian live in unrepentant sin? 
So I'm not going to go so far as to say they're not saved. I, I don't think I want to take it to that extreme, right? Um, I will say this. It calls into question the authenticity of their salvation. Um, it kind of just makes you wonder. You know, when you see somebody who just harbors bitterness and anger on the inside, it makes you wonder. I'm not going to say that they are not saved, but it just it, it brings up questions that would be better left resolved if that was not an issue, right? Um, unforgiveness can greatly hinder prayers and spiritual growth. But God is gracious. He is merciful. And in his grace and in his mercy, he may discipline a person. Um, in order to bring them to a place of repentance. So it's not that they're cast out and they're not saved, but it's that God is dealing with them as he does with his son. Now some, some will point to the parable of the unforgiving servant in Matthew chapter 18, verses 23 through 35, um, as sort of a proof that a person can lose their salvation over unforgiveness. Um, I don't necessarily think that's the case with this chapter. I think it's an example of what it is to harbor unforgiveness and the way that God would deal with a person to bring them to a place of repentance. I don't think it's saying that they, they're not going to be saved anymore, but you tell me what you guys think. I, I, I'd love to hear from you. Um, can a person live in unrepentant sin? Can a person live with unforgiveness and still be saved? Drop a comment. Let me know what you guys think about that. But it, 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 it begs this question as well. Is forgiveness conditional? Um, let me, let me just tell you what I'm talking about. Matthew chapter 6, verses 14 and 15, directly after the conversation surrounding the Lord's Prayer, Jesus has this to say, For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. So what do these verses mean? What is that saying to us? That's, that's, that's a pretty stark um, rebuke that if a person doesn't forgive, then God won't forgive them. And we believe that, we agree with that, but what does it actually mean to say that? It means that forgiving others is not so much a requirement as it is a realization. Until we realize our sin of unforgiveness, God will not forgive us. But why? Because we don't really understand our need and we don't really understand how sinful we are. And we don't understand God's grace. So God's not going to shed his grace and forgiveness on us unless we are first being open and honest before him. We cannot hide our sin from God and God still forgive it. He wouldn't be a just God if he were to do that. So what it is, if when he says that your father won't forgive you if you don't forgive others, he's saying because you're not being honest with him. Right? He's saying that, that he can't work in your life, he won't work in your life until you are first open and forward and honest with him, saying, I am sinful, forgive me, and then he will forgive you for that sin of unforgiveness, if I can say it that way, and give you grace, hopefully, to move on in forgiveness in your own life. We need God's forgiveness, but repentance takes honesty. So does forgiveness. When we get honest with God, we get honest with ourselves. When we seek God's forgiveness honestly, we learn to honestly forgive others. It's that, it's that, it's that point of realization, right? Um, it's not the requirement portion, it's the realization. I realize I need to forgive this person. They've done me wrong, and I want God to forgive me, but I need to forgive them as well. And God works across the board to bring peace in all of these situations, right? So praying for and about forgiveness is difficult. It really is. It's not the easiest thing to do to think about forgiving others. That is why it's a prayer. Many times prayers are not easy to offer. Many times when we think of prayer, it's not the easiest thing to do. That's why we pray about it. We see the need there. We bring the need before God. And in this prayer, in this petition, the prayer is, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, forgive me of all of my debts. And yes, help me to be honest enough before you and other people, to forgive them as well, right? Um, forgiveness, uh, it exposes us for who we really are, but it's necessary. So here's my, here's my advice. If you're struggling to forgive, I want you to know this, you're not alone. You're not going through this by yourself. There are a lot of others in the world that have struggled through unforgiveness just like you have. You're not alone in that sense, but you're also not alone in that God has forsaken you. 
Christ will walk through you through your path of unforgiveness. When you're struggling to forgive someone else, God will be there in that time for you. Most of us, maybe all of us, have struggled this way at one time or the other in our lives. That's why we pray the prayer. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And we pray it as many times as we need to, not in some vain repetition style that we feel like if I can just pray it over and over and over that somehow God will fix it. No, but we realize I, I prayed and I, 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 I don't feel satisfied. I need to go back and pray again. Not, not through vain repetition, but through that continual seeking. Um, in hope, in faith, right? Um, we have hope that God will help us to be forgiving. And we also have faith to know that he will. So the prayers forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lord, forgive us. And it's just that simple. He wants to forgive, and he cares about all of us. So I'm praying for you guys. Grace, peace be unto you. Until next time, guys, God bless. I'll catch you later.